Good evening. Today we're going to be covering chapter two. No, it's okay. The speaker might need to be a minute. But you see, I did hit the button and the slide left. Yeah. You feel it's on. Good evening. Today we're going to be covering chapter two in your arguments and arguing book. The title of this chapter is The Foundation of Argument. In this lecture, we'll be covering the key terms. I'll explain to you what a narrative paradigm is, and we'll also discuss what you can expect to, look, to learn as the quarter progresses in this class in argumentation. A narrative is a way of having the characteristics of a story. And Walter Fisher described the narrative paradigm as the way someone relates their personal experiences to the larger story. Narrative probability is the degree to which a story is coherent. Does this story make sense? Fidelity, narrative fidelity, answers the question, does this story ring true? What's the likelihood of this story being true? So it's important for all the elements of narrative to come together for it to, to have narrative probability. It's more likely that this story fits together like a jigsaw puzzle and that it makes sense and it's true. And all of, the, all of those elements are present, then each person interprets that through her or his narrative paradigm, which means the narrative, the overall narrative becomes a personal story to that individual. And through that is how she or he interprets the larger story. Here's a beautiful mansion. It's got cars and a fountain and flowers and it's made of brick. This house started as a foundation. Bare land. Before a foundation, it was just a plot of dirt. Studs went up, some wood, and then finally, the working crew put the bricks in there and the mansion was built. But it could not have been built on something without a solid foundation. So to begin with, it becomes an outline, kind of a ghost house with just boards. And it's a place that provides shelter, but it's not insulated, it's not warm. You might be able to sleep there, but you won't be able to sleep there in the winter. No functioning plumbing. It doesn't have anything in it. It's just a skeleton. But before the house has a foundation, it's a thought in your mind. And the equivalent of that would be the blueprint. So in order for a house to become a mansion, it has to start at a blueprint and move toward the building of the foundation, which is the walls and the floor. And finally, it becomes the mansion made of brick with indoor plumbing and a lovely kitchen, everything that a house is. In argumentation, many times, this comes from personal values or life experience, which is to what Walter Fisher refers as the narrative paradigm. It's simply a set of your personal experiences and values that you bring into any situation. People argue over nothing sometimes. And often, especially in interpersonal relationships, they don't even know about what they're arguing. They get into it, discussions get heated, and feelings get hurt. In this class, we're going to learn about argumentation in a more, format, in a more formal way, where there's a format, and each party takes turns. And each side of a formal debate or, or argument has a set amount of time during which they can present their set of facts. When you do argue, empathy is paramount. It's very important for you to understand from where the person comes. Because if everyone has a different narrative paradigm about the same issue, then one person is not going to be able to fully relate to another person or another side without understanding why that person or that group believes the way it does. And this is, this is again, encompassing the narrative paradigm, where it answers the question, why does this person or this group of people feel the way 
she, he does, or they do. So let's take homelessness, for example, because this is an issue that's debated on a regular basis and it has two very concrete sides. For example, one side says, let's house the homeless. Let's take them and give them apartments. And some cities are actually doing this. What that does is it treats the individual. We take the homeless person, instead of being a large amount of homeless people, it's one person in need of help. And it puts that person or that family into an apartment and, and, and gives them the freedom of being able to be independent. The person arguing for, for, for this side may say, this keeps our streets cleaner because Homeless will set up their camps, and when they leave, there's trash, and, and they have to, of course, dispose of their personal waste somewhere. It also improves public safety because it doesn't impede the sidewalks, and it makes neighborhoods safer overall. And the sanitation issues caused by large groups of homeless individuals can bring on sanitary conditions. So this side of the argument may say housing the homeless keeps everyone healthier homeless and non-homeless. Meanwhile, on the other side of the argument, it could be, let's maintain the status quo. Let's keep the homeless exactly as they are because, how, because taking care of the homeless would require an overhaul to the mental health system. And that's simply too expensive. We would need to educate people or at least give higher pay to people who are already doctors of mental health and have them counsel these people and prescribe medications that are necessary and give them ongoing therapy. Because a lot of people will say that the homeless problem is caused by a mental health problem, a lack of treatment for the mentally ill. And they would also say, people on the side, that it's too expensive. We don't want to pay more in taxes to be able to house the homeless. It's, it's, it's simply too expensive. It's too large of a problem. We, we, they believe in leaving it up to shelters and nonprofit organizations to feed and clothe the homeless. So if nonprofit organizations are doing it, and those nonprofits are funded by, by donors, private donors, and corporate, then that's not a problem that these taxpayers should have to deal with. And this side of the argument would also say, Perhaps the focus needs to be on providing job skills. If people are homeless because they don't know any job skills, then let's deal with their problems. If they need rehabilitation for perhaps drugs and alcohol or mental health conditions, then let's get them the help, the help they need and focus on training them for actual jobs and then they'll be able to provide their own housing. Now in this class, as we focus on argumentation, it's important to, to know the questions involved. Before you set up any argument, you have to say, what issues are worth an argument? Do I really want to be bothered to argue this? We could have a fun argument, for example, on the benefits of going to Del Taco or the benefits of going to Taco Bell. That is a viable argument, but perhaps we decide that's not on what we want to focus our time. So, is an issue worth your argument? And another element of that is you have to decide, is the issue too large? Are people too in, in, invested in their side? A, a huge example of this is abortion. Someone will be pro-life or pro-choice based upon their narrative paradigm. And if they're pro-life, chances are you will never be able to successfully persuade them to be on the pro-choice side. So what happens is it alienates people. If, if the issue is simply too explosive and it's too personal, it will serve to alienate. And that's not the goal. The goal is effective communication. We also want to know how we adjust our argument to a particular audience. For example, are we doing a classroom debate or are we in politics and we're trying to win an office on the world stage? You want, a, a politician wants to sell her or himself to people and say, vote for me and this is why you will be voting for me. Settings and styles vary. 
which works off of how we adjust to a particular audience. Business meetings are handled in one way, where it could, can become a little volatile, but it's always with, with the, the, the goal of resolution. We want to work toward what's in the best interest of the business and moving the business forward. Of course, arguments ensue among family members and friends, and how you handle those is, is more inter interpersonal communication. You wanna handle each person as an individual because maybe you relate to a relative differently than you relate to a friend. Now in a courtroom, we have the defense and the prosecution. The defense is going to argue a present set of facts in a particular manner, and the prosecution will argue that same set of facts in a different fashion. And the goal is never cohesion. The, the defense and prosecution never argue to, in order to meet with a resolution. It's up to the jury to see which side presents that same set of facts more effectively and thus vote to acquit or put the, lock a person away in prison. Here in the classroom, our setting is different. We're, we're, we're learning as an educational environment. We'll have a more relaxed kind of, of argumentation, but it still is serving a purpose so one side can persuade the other side that her or he has the strongest set of, of arguments. Meanwhile, on the Senate floor, politicians will debate back and forth and they will filibuster for days, sometimes weeks, and they get very deadlocked. That's a, that's a completely different kind of argument. And it's not personal. That kind of argument does not come from, from usually not come from a personal set of values. It's more about what is better for the larger set of people. And of course, there's formal academic debate, as you would see on the forensics team, where each side has a certain amount of time, and then a, a set of judges will decide who wins that debate, who presents their arguments best. The limits of argumentation include, it's important to know whether or not to argue at all. Again, abortion is probably an issue you don't want to bring up because it, it, it gets people fired up, it, it alienates people, and it hurts a lot of feelings. It's not a very productive topic. You need to know what to include in the argument. What are the most solid points? For example, if a person is running for president, you want to convince a specific audience, perhaps at a rally in Memphis, why those people should vote for you. You're going to speak to those people differently than you'll speak to an audience in Detroit. It's important, it's imperative to envision your opponent's arguments. We want to anticipate what the opposition will say and be able to refute that. But at the same time, can see that if these people are skilled at arguing, they're going to have some very viable strengths. And you're going to want to concede that this point is perhaps stronger than what I have to say about that. But why don't you listen to me on this? Think about the implications of the argument. Do you want to have a relationship in the future with the people with whom you're arguing? If that's the case, it's important to make sure that you handle the situation delicately and with fragility and be conscientious of other people's feelings. And you want to also answer, is this argument hurting more than it's helping? If I'm serving to alienate someone, then perhaps I'm hurting my cause more than I'm helping it. So it's important, people, for you to remember that next week, we will be going over chapter three, and it is the audiences and fields of argument. Please make sure you read the entire chapter and come with a set of study questions. I also want you to write a reflection, and this will be on, on what you've learned today and why it's so important to build that foundation before you can build up and up and up to get the chimney on the mansion. So I hope you learned a lot today and make sure that you bring your reflection with you next week and we, we will go over chapter three.